we move your strength toward we use our wisdom and through the saint lament. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd also like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. Today we will be continuing our study in Paul's letter to the church at Rome as we continue in chapter 10 and our verse reading will begin at 16. As we read this, let us remember that this is the word of God, inspired by the spirit of God. And so may we invite that same Holy Spirit to make this come alive to us. And so as we begin reading at verse 16, through the Spirit we find. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly proclaims, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Let us pray as we seek God's guidance. O oh Lord, I come before you today acknowledging that I need you. I need you in all things, and I know, Lord, that I cannot teach this word without the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. And so I ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit's guidance, your power, your anointing. Lord, I ask that you would make me a vessel that is clean, one that is fit for your use, that you wash me thoroughly in the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for each one that is listening today that your Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts. We're all in a different place in our journey with you. You know what we need to hear. And I know, Lord, while I cannot speak to every heart, I know that your Holy Spirit can and does. And so we yield ourselves up before you, praying your will will be done. And it's in the name of our Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. We have all deliberately rebelled against God. Willfully violated his commands. Therefore, God's evaluation of humanity is that there is not one who is righteous. There's not one who does good, not even one. God's verdict is that we have no righteousness of our own. And yet God loves us and he offers us the free gift of righteousness, the free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. He offers to make us as clean and as pure as if we had never sinned. And all we have to do to receive that gift is believe in our Lord Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life. It's that simple. It is God's universal offer of salvation. Paul writes, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone 
There are no restrictions. It has nothing to do with nationality or race or social standing or what one can comprehend mentally with that or how bright or not so bright we might be. There are no moral restrictions. It doesn't matter what sins you may have committed. It doesn't matter how bad you may have been. And you don't have to get your life straightened out first. In fact, that's a lie that comes from Satan. What God says to you is come just as you are. And we'll work on you after that. And he begins this amazing work of transformation after we call on the name of the Lord. And in the Bible, it's called sanctification. And that means he begins making us more and more like Jesus. You see, it's that simple. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But there is one problem, and that's if you think you're good. If you think you have a righteousness of our own, you will never call on the name of the Lord. If you think you're good, or good enough, you don't think you need a Savior. That's really the only thing that can stand between you and Christ. It's simple. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But in that short sentence, it also introduces us to the universal condition of salvation. We have to call on the name of the Lord. We can do absolutely nothing to save ourselves. We need a Savior. His name is Jesus, and he paid our sin debt. And so salvation is for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Now, what that does mean is when we call on the name of the Lord, we come before him humbly. We come before him in repentance and in confession, acknowledging that we are sinners and that we are unrighteous. We come before him in faith and we call upon the only one who can save us. And we put our trust in Christ alone for salvation. And we confess him as our Lord. As Paul wrote in chapter 10, verse 9, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, that brings us to the universal promise of salvation that everyone who calls on his name will be saved. The moment we commit our life to Christ, he gives us this unfailing promise of salvation. And he also gives us the promise that anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That means God is never going to bring your past up. He's never going to throw it in your face. Satan will. Others might. But God doesn't. You'll never be put to shame in this life nor in the judgment to come. When you stand before God in the judgment, you will stand there confident. Not in yourself, but as a redeemed, blood-bought child of God. One whose sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus and you are standing there clothed in the very righteousness of Christ. Calling on the name of the Lord is so simple. And yet there is this complex process that is behind it. Calling on the name of the Lord is simply the final step in that process. But in order to call on the name of the Lord, we have to believe in him. Now, believing in him has nothing to do with the emotions. 
Now, that's not to say that some people don't experience emotions. Some people experience a flood of emotions. Some people, when they come to know Jesus Christ personally, they feel the entire weight of the burden of their sin and their guilt lifted off of them, and they feel freer than they've ever felt in their life, and they are flooded with emotions. Others feel like for the first time in their life they've truly been loved. And so they are filled with a flood of emotions in that. And others don't feel anything. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just that we're all different. We respond to things differently. It's still the same promise. It has nothing to do with the emotions, but if you believe in the name of Jesus, then the mind has to be engaged. Emotions may not be, but the mind has to be. It's when you hear that message of Christ and what he has done for you, and now you understand it personally in your life. And not only do you understand it, you believe it. You believe the message of Christ is true. You believe that Jesus is God incarnate, that he came to this earth, that he died on the cross to pay your sin debt, that he rose again from the dead. But it's also more than an intellectual affirmation of the truth. It is possible to have it in your head and still not have it in your heart. See, in order to call upon the name of the Lord means that we are also committed to that truth. I believe the truth and I am committed to it. And if I'm committed to truth, I act upon it. And that means I am committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. Just believing that something is true changes nothing. I know I've shared this with you before, but I can believe that eating healthy is good for me, but until I am committed to that, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever in my life. And the same thing's true about Jesus. I can believe everything the gospel says about Jesus Christ, but until I am committed to that, nothing changes. And the moment I'm committed to it, I am saved. It's that simple. But in order to believe, you have to hear. Behind the belief is the message. And it is the message of Christ. The word of Christ has to be proclaimed. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And behind the message is the messenger. Someone has to bring the message. It has to be proclaimed and behind the one who is the messenger is the one who sends and that's God it's his message it's his offer of salvation and he is the one who is not willing that anyone should perish See, God has made it so simple for us. All we have to do is call on the name of the Lord, and yet there is this complex process that is going on behind it. God's taking care of all of that. And I think it's important for us to understand the process because that then helps us to understand just how much God loves us, how much he wants you to be redeemed and a part of his kingdom. How much he has done everything just to reach a sinner like me. Now, not only does he offer us the gift of salvation in that, but God then invites us to be a part of the process to where we become the messengers that he is sending. In fact, not only does he invite us, He commands us to be a part of the process. Go and make disciples. And I know that scares almost all of us. How do I, I don't know what to say. I got a solution to that. Work on what to say. 
But here's where you start. I've shared this with you so many times. To be a witness is to share your story. If you've never done this, I want to invite you to do this. And if you've done it, I want to invite you to reread it. But you need to write out your faith story. And I'm going to give you the outline because everybody's faith story follows the same outline. And all you have to do is look at the calendar to know what it is. You have B.C., you have the cross, and you have A.D. The B.C., just as on the calendar before Christ, on the, I know today they want to call it before the common error. That's a bunch of baloney. We all know where B.C. came from. It's before Christ came to this earth. And so B.C. is your life before you come to know Christ. What was my life like? What was I like? And then the cross is how I come to meet Jesus. What led me to that point of calling upon the name of the Lord? And then the A.D., which we know means in the year of our Lord, rather than after the common era, is my life after that decision. It's your A.D., your year of the Lord, what God has been doing in my life since I come to know Him. See, work on it. Then you know what to say. And here's the second part. You invite the Holy Spirit to be a part of it. You don't do this alone. You listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you when to go. The Holy Spirit will tell you when to talk. And the Holy Spirit will tell you when to shut up. Now, don't confuse the Holy Spirit with the flesh or the devil, which is always telling you to shut up. Make sure it's the Holy Spirit. There is a time to talk and there's a time not to talk. There's a time to listen. And you listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. But God's inviting you, commanding you to be a part of that process as his messenger. And so once we know the love and the mercy and the grace of God and everything that he has done to bring salvation into our lives, it brings us to the mystery of unbelief. It's a mystery because unbelief just simply doesn't make sense. We find this strange reaction to the message, the gospel of Christ when it is proclaimed. And so concerning Israel, Paul shares it this way, but not all Israel accepted the good news. See, it brings us to the reality, not everyone is going to accept it. Not everyone will receive it. The truth is, many will reject it. Now, this comes back to with you being a messenger. Let me share this. When you go as the messenger, you have to remember this. They're not rejecting you. You are not offering yourself as a means of salvation. They are rejecting Jesus. And I know we don't like rejection in life. And I think that's the reason some of us refuse to be messengers. We're afraid somebody's going to reject us. Well, it's Jesus that is being rejected. And so that raises the question, why would anyone reject Jesus? See, it's strange. It, it's strange how suspicious people can be of the gospel. It's strange how self-reliant we think that we are. It's strange why anyone would reject good news of salvation. And yet, Isaiah says that was his experience, as Paul quotes him. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? You see, Isaiah came to the people of Israel at a time when they were living in idolatry and degradation. They were surrounded by an enemy on the verge of being overcome. And God gives Isaiah a message. He's a messenger and he sends him to proclaim the good news about a coming Messiah whose life and death would redeem them from their sins. And after he proclaims the message, he's left asking, who has believed our message? You see, what the people were wanting was someone to be a political Messiah for them. Do we need, are you, okay. 
And l let's just lift Julia up in prayer right now. And uh, Denise and Rick, as they're helping her. Lord, we come before you right now, and we just want to lift Julia up before your throne. You know exactly what is going on with her. We pray, Lord, right now that your Holy Spirit will just flood her with your power, your strength, and your presence, Lord. We pray for your healing. You know exactly what's going on here and what she needs, Lord. And so we just want to commit her into your care right now. Lord, you take care of her. You are the great physician, and so we give her up to you right now, Lord. And it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we ask this. Amen. Isaiah came to the people, and he proclaims this tremendous message of good news about a coming Messiah whose life and death would redeem them from their sin. And the people rejected it. What they were looking for was not a Messiah who would save them from their sins. They wanted a political Messiah who would come and deliver them politically in the world they were living in. And we're not any different, are we? Here we are in an election cycle, although we're in a constant election cycle anymore. I remember when election cycle used to begin about a year before the election, and now it starts as soon as one is over. New president's not even sworn in, or the former president's not sworn in, and we just go right back into it. But here we are in an election year, let's put it that way. And what I find is that a lot of people are looking for a Messiah. They're looking for someone to save them. Read my lips, no politician is going to be your Messiah. They're not going to save you, and they're not going to save a nation. Jesus is the Messiah, and it's not political. This is someone who comes, and their life and death will redeem us from our sin. And so when Jesus came, the people of Israel rejected him, just as many people do today. See, we could ask the same question as Isaiah. Who has believed our message? And so Paul isolates the problem in verse 17. He says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. See, faith is aroused by hearing. And after you hear the message of Christ, you either believe it, or you reject it. The real issue is Jesus. And it's the very same question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Is he just a man? Or is he divine? And some people who come to the conclusion that Jesus is just a man can't leave it that he was just a man. So they will say, well, he was a really good teacher. Or that Jesus was a great prophet. That he was a good man. But that really makes no sense whatsoever. Because Jesus claimed to be divine. He claimed to be God. They crucified him because he claimed to be God. You see, if Jesus isn't divine, then he was a liar or a lunatic because he claimed to be someone that he would not have been. And if someone does that, then you can't trust them. I mean, we see that we're in politics again. Let's bring it up again. There have been politicians who tell you they are something they are not. One of them I've heard more than once is when they tell you about their time in the military and how they served and all that they did. And then lo and behold, if somehow you don't find out they were never even in the military or they never were where they were at. They've lied. How can you ever believe someone that says that? And so Jesus is not just a mere man. If he's a mere man, he's a liar, or he was self-deceived, a lunatic who thought he was somebody that he was not. And so if you think Jesus is a mere man, you've got to let the other stuff go. But if he's more than a man, then Jesus is divine. He is Lord. 
See, this is the whole issue that people have to deal with. Is Jesus who he says he is? Now, linked to the issue of Jesus is the question, do you need a Savior? Do you know that you're a sinner and that you need someone that is going to save you from your sin? And if you do, Jesus is the only answer. And if you don't think you need a Savior, then you reject Him. And that brings us to the inescapable conclusion. Verse 18, but I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. And then as proof, Paul quotes from Psalm 19, verse 4, when he says, their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Now, who's their voice? Well, if you go back and you start reading in Psalm 19, in the first four verses, it is the voice of creation. It is the universal proclamation from uh, creation that he is God. There is a creator. It's the same message that Paul brought up in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, when he said, because of creation's witness, that we are left without excuse. See, creation itself is the evidence of God. It's not a lot of light, but it is light. And it means that if we observe that light of God in creation, then he is going to bring more light to us. And so like the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists just from that light of creation. And then he goes on and says, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Once you see that light and you are seeking after God, he is going to give you all of the light that we need. More light will be given. And yet we also know that God in his grace often gives us more light even when we refused nature's testimony. I think this nation is an example of that. The United States is being given a great deal of light. And what we see taking place is just because there is a great light does not mean that there is more belief. Unbelief can reject a great light just as it does a dim one. And just as Israel rejected the gospel so has this nation. I know that we like to find comfort in thinking that this is a Christian nation. And I know over 50% of the people in this country still tell you that they're Christians. And here it is Sunday morning, and I just have a simple question. Then where are they? They're not even thinking about God. That's a strange kind of Christianity. One that doesn't fulfill his command to not forsake assembling together. I think a lot of people have fooled themselves. Oh, they have it all up here. They believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Or they like some of the things that Jesus said, and I know people that way too. They like a lot of things that Jesus said. They don't like some other things that he said. But the things they like, and they think if they like it, that makes them a believer. No, it doesn't. It means, yeah, I may have something in my head, but I've never made a commitment because commitment changes everything. And so just like Israel, we are stubborn in our unbelief. And yet God in his love uses another principle to arouse belief in some. It's the principle of jealousy. And again, Paul, using the people of Israel, says in verse 19 through 20, Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly proclaims, 
I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Jealousy is a part of our fallen nature. And God will use that as well. All we need to do to understand jealousy is to observe a child. You give them a toy. And they'll play with that toy until they get tired of it. And then they'll put it aside and completely forget about it until another child comes along and picks it up. And then they want it back. That's exactly how jealousy works. And so God will use that principle as well. He says, Moses says that God will use a people with a far less understanding. You see, the Jewish people were given a great deal of light and understanding about God, something no other nation had had given to them. They were given the law, they were given the prophets, they were given the temple worship, they were given the sacrificial system. They were given all of this light. And after they rejected the Messiah, God sent the message to the Gentiles, those of us who were living in darkness. Now today there's also another comparison that comes to that because it's one of the groups that seems to reject the gospel not as all of them but as a whole most do and that is the educated elites. Now listen to me, I have nothing against education but I do have something against academic arrogance and if you think you're an elite I'm not the only one who has something against that. God has some things to say about pride. And as a whole, they have rejected the message of the gospel. It's not that they don't know the message. It's that they have rejected the gospel, and God is sending his message to those that they feel are below them. I read a statement one time that said that uh, it is possible to be educated beyond your intelligence. I've known some people educated beyond their intelligence. I've known some who've gone into ministry that were educated beyond their intelligence and far beyond what their faith could handle. And so he says that he will send his messenger and that will be received by those with lesser understanding. Isn't it amazing? A poor, uneducated person can have more knowledge of God than the wisest of the educated. But he also said that Isaiah says God will use a people less motivated. The Jewish people were zealous for God. The Gentiles were ignorant of the one true living God. They weren't even thinking about him. And God sent his message to the Gentiles that through Christ we might experience the love and the grace and the riches of God. And all to arouse jealousy among those who had been given a great light. And then he says, God patiently continues to reach out. Verse 21, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now you got to remember this is God speaking. One day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. For a long time, God has been holding out his hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. In fact, I think that is the very reason that Jesus Christ has not yet returned. Biblically, everything that needs to take place is happening. You can see how the stage is being set. And I think that the reason Jesus has not yet returned is because God is holding out his hand to a rebellious and disobedient and an obstinate people. But only God knows how long he'll hold it out. It won't be forever. There will come a day when that offer will be removed. Unbelief, it's a mystery, doesn't make sense, it's irrational, it's not logical, and God has done everything so that we might be saved. 
You know, in order to go into eternity without Christ, you have to resist God. There'll not be one person separated from Christ that has not resisted him. Or another way of stating that is there'll not be one person in hell that was not disobedient and obstinate. Every one of them. But the good news is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We ask that you will just take it and use it in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, not just at the moment, but as we depart, as we leave here today, that you will just continue working with what it is you want us to hear from you. And it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. This morning we will be sharing in communion together. If you've not yet received a communion packet, I would ask you just to slip up your hand and Cindy will see to it that you get one of those this morning. We read in the scriptures that on that Thursday night, the night that our Lord was betrayed, he met in the upper room with his disciples. And he shared with them that he had had a great desire to share in this particular Passover. It wouldn't have been the first Passover that he would have shared with them, but it was this one that he had a great desire for. And I think it's because he was going to make Passover come alive. The true meaning behind the Passover. Everything that was done in the Passover had an order to it. They call it the Seder. And every year, every family, the Passover would be the same. But that Passover would be different for Jesus and his disciples. As they met in the upper room that evening, Jesus took the bread. Now, there was nothing unusual about that. He was supposed to take the bread. But it was what he said, because Jesus went off script. And he said, this bread is my body. No one had ever said that before. And then he blessed it. Oh Lord, we thank you for the bread that came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate and died, but that whoever eats this bread lives forever. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. And then he broke it. After that, he took the cup. There were four cups that evening. It was probably the cup of redemption. And again, Jesus goes off script. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And then he blessed it. Oh Lord, you teach us in your word that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And yet your word also tells us that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. We thank you for the one that John identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed to cover over our sin debt. Amen. And then Jesus invited his disciples to partake. And so if you would take your communion packet, I would invite you to peel this cellophane back for the bread. The body of Christ given for you. And now if you would peel the foil back 
And as always, you'll want to do that carefully and gently. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. O oh Lord, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself to be the sacrifice for our sins. We thank you for the gift of salvation and that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song.